Um, today I want to go to Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, and to read verses 1 to 17. Just while you're finding that, um, let me tell you a little bit about why we're here today. Um, because uh, last week, as you may recall, was Pentecost, and we, we looked at um, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the birthday of the church. And as the church was born and then began to grow, uh, we read some amazing things about the church in those early days. One of the things, of course, was the phenomenal growth of the church numerically. The church grew on the very first day from uh, a small group to 3,000 plus. That's pretty amazing for one day's work, really, isn't it? But we read that that wasn't the, the only time of phenomenal growth. I mean, perhaps that was the biggest growth uh, uh, of uh, any single day. But we read that the church continued to grow daily. On a daily basis, there were more and more people were added to their numbers. And we read at one point of 5,000 of the believers meeting together in the uh, the outer courts of the temple. That's where they used to meet. I guess it was difficult to try and find a building that would hold 5,000 uh, in Jerusalem. And so the temple courts were probably the best place to go. Um, so the church grew and it grew and it grew. But we also have a little insight into the life of the believers and how they conducted themselves. Uh, they gave themselves wholly to the Lord, to the teaching of the apostles, to prayer, and to one another too. And it's wonderful to see how the church grew in grace. And today I want us to look um, and say, how does the church grow, I suppose, is really what we're looking at. Um, because that's ultimately what every church should be looking for, it's growth. But what is the growth we're looking for? How does it come about? And so I've entitled today, Christ in You, although uh, the eagle-eyed ones among you, as we read through Colossians, might sort of argue, perhaps we should have called it You in Christ. Um, but anyway, it's called Christ in You. Um, so let's read from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Since then you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to the earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom 
And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. How does a church grow? So that's probably the heart of the question that we're trying to ask today. It's probably the heart of what every church is about. It certainly should be. Every church is supposed to look for growth. Unfortunately, sometimes our reasoning, our motivations can sometimes be a little bit off the mark, shall we say. I was fascinated to uh, receive a link um, by a friend who I ought to just add is an Anglican minister. Um, and he sent me the link saying, I thought this might fascinate you. And it was an article in the Daily Telegraph. And the article was, it was actually back in February. It's not um, absolutely uh, recent. It's a few months ago. The General Synod was meeting in London. General Synod is the, the sort of the governing uh, body of the Church of England. They meet a couple of times a year, um, once down here and uh, the other time July up in York. And in their uh, uh, earlier meeting this year, um, the press, of course, listening in very carefully to what's being said. It's the state church, after all. And the things that are said in this article, and we assume that the journalist has reported them accurately, um, could probably be said of a lot of different denominations, possibly uh, the Baptist church too. Um, but of course, this is going to get more press coverage. But I found it a fascinating article to read. And uh, I'm just going to highlight a few things here out of the article. I won't bore you with the whole thing. The Church of England is facing another 30 years of decline, according to internal projections revealed for the first time. It is preparing to pump £72 million into a reform and renewal drive, which includes plans to ordain 6,000 more clergy in the 2020s to build a younger priesthood, uh, which is less male-dominated and less white. I always feel discriminated against when I see those things. Um, the Archbishop of Canterbury has also initiated a major drive to win new converts. Well, I'm pleased to hear that was in there. Currently, around 18 in every 1,000 people in England regularly attend Church of England services. In 30 years' time, the proportion is likely to drop to 10 in every thousand, or 1%. That rate of decline suggests that attendance at Sunday services across the whole of England would dip to just 425,000. So I won't bother you, uh, bore you with the, the rest of the article. You get the gist of it. The church is facing decline. I say most denominations are facing decline. Um, the Baptist church is facing decline. We're all facing decline. But I was interested to read some of the strategies that apparently seem to be coming out. Now, we have to be um, fair here that this is a journalist reporting trying to get maximum readership out of the article. So I don't know how balanced um, this journalist is being. But of course, it's the big numbers, isn't it, that kind of grab the attention. £72 million being pumped into reform and renewal. I did notice at the end of the article that one senior member of the Synod said, reform and renewal, or sorry, renewal and reform is known by some as search and rescue. Um, I think that's probably a little bit of sour grapes there somewhere, but... Um, you kind of get the feeling that there is this urgency and this desperate um, uh, sense 
in what's coming um, through the church here. £72 million is being poured into this reform and renewal. Um, they want to ordain 6,000 more clergy um, to build a younger priesthood. Um, we want it to be more politically correct, so it's got to be less male and, and less male dominated and, and less white. You know, these sorts of things, these are the, the things that we look for to say, yeah, actually, that's, that's being proactive, that's kind of looking ahead. And yet I question whether that is really right. I did hope you picked up on the, the, the fact that to try and give that some balance, I did quote the fact that the Archbishop did actually say that um, he's also initiated a major drive to win new converts. Um, that's good too. I'd like to know what that strategy is. Winning new converts. Converts to what? Converts to the church? Or converts to Christ? And if we win new converts to Christ, what do we do with those converts? Because actually that's what this is about today. Christ in you. Or as I say, you might argue, you in Christ. That's what this is all about. And Paul speaks to the Colossian church. And the Colossian church is made up of um, a mix of people. Many of them will come from a Greek background. There will be, of course, uh, some Jews that have been spread out um, across that part of the world too. But it's largely a Gentile church. They've come from a background that is not a Christian background and heritage as we have here today. And surely that must make it much harder when you've come from a Greco-Roman background. All of the, the gods and the religion and the customs that go with the Greco-Roman culture. And then you come in with this, this new way of thinking based on someone who walked on the earth only a few years before, claiming to be God's Messiah. And of course, as far as the Gentiles were concerned, well, that's only for the Jews anyway. What has that got to do with me? And yet the amazing thing is that the church was growing and growing and growing in those early years. What was the secret of the growth? Did Paul pour 72 million drachmas or something like that into his ministry? Far from it. Very often Paul has mentioned the fact that on occasions he had nothing. Did Paul go with the strategy of saying, we had better appoint 6,000 new ministers across that part of the world? Well, he was certainly always appointing new church leaders. I don't know whether he had any figures in mind. I doubt that very much. To be fair, the article... And one of the bishops um, uh, commenting uh, uh, on what was going on in the Church of England, he did make the point that the church shouldn't just appoint ministers for the sake of it, but that we want good quality people who are right for the job. And I think that's true too. And I think that's in exactly the way that Paul would have worked. He wouldn't have allowed just anybody to take care of the churches that he was uh, founding. He would have wanted people to be the right people. They had to be right in their hearts and their minds and their attitudes. But I think more importantly than that, was not so much about how many leaders can we appoint, but how many individuals can we find on whom the Spirit of Christ will rest. That's what they were praying for. That's what they were working towards. I want to divide what I have to say this morning into two basic categories. Um, the first one, head in the clouds, and the second one, feet on the ground. 
head in the clouds and feet on the ground. Let's, let's look, shall we, at head in the clouds to begin with. And roughly speaking, we're, we're sticking here with the first 11 verses of this passage for head in the clouds. Paul says in verse 2, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Set your your minds on things above, not on earthly things. That's head in the clouds. He says, I want you to think completely differently to the way that your fellows are thinking. Now, say that must be quite difficult. We are in a culture here in the UK that has a long Christian heritage. We are kicking and raiding against it like crazy, I have to say, as society. But that is our culture and background. And therefore, it is actually slightly easier for us as Christians and as the church to be drawing people's attention to the principles of Scripture. Our laws are based upon the Bible, or at least they were. I think we're getting away from that a little bit now. But they were based on Scripture. And yet, there are an increasing number of people who would not recognize that and have turned completely away from that. And what they do and what they think and how they, how they go about their lives today is completely alien to anything that you would find in the pages of your Bible. And Paul says, even more so to these predominantly Gentile believers, but even to the old um, uh, Jews who have been converted to Christ, he's saying to them, actually says, I want you to forget all of the, the standards that this world puts in place He says, you have to have a much higher way of thinking. He says, I want you to look up. I want you to be looking at Christ instead. Christ in all his glory. You know, I think to myself sometimes about the Apostle John. There he was working with Jesus, walking with Jesus Day and night for those three years. He must have come to know him well. Jesus loved him greatly. He loved Jesus greatly. And yet, all those years later, when he saw Jesus again, in that vision that he had, which we call the Revelation, John describes the risen, glorious Christ that he sees And yet he must have looked so, so different to the Jesus that he remembered walking around the lake, teaching the people on the hillsides, going to the festivals in Jerusalem. It must have been awe-inspiring. It must have been dreadful. Because we read that John fell with his face to the floor, When he saw him, he was so filled with terror because of the glorious vision of Christ that he saw. And the problem today is that so very often that we are still seeing Jesus as the Jesus who walked around the lake. The Jesus who went to the festivals in Jerusalem. The Jesus who was here on earth walking with the people. And that's wonderful in one sense because God deliberately came a man so that he could identify with us. But you have to raise your thinking much higher than that. Because if you stay at that level, you become the person who says that Jesus was a very moral character. Jesus was very moralistic. A great teacher. He said a lot of wise things. But you have to bring your thinking above that. And you have to say, but I need to capture a vision of Jesus now as the risen, glorious, ascended Lord Jesus Christ. And when you do that, no longer do you see Jesus as, excuse the irreverence here, your mate. 
who comes alongside you each day. But you see him as the king of kings, admittedly one to whom you have been granted to come into his presence, but to bow before him, to give him all honour and respect. And when we do that, that transforms our lives. We're no longer satisfied with just being mediocre, but instead we want to live the very best that we can for him. Because something of his glory reflects in us and should reflect in us. And so it's important to have our head in the clouds, to set your hearts and to set your minds on things above. Now, unfortunately, there are hindrances to that, common hindrances that get in the way and mean that we still think in our old earthly terms. And in verse 5, Paul speaks about those. He says, therefore, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And then he begins to list, not an exclusive list, but a few of the prominent things that were around in his day. And just to show you that society doesn't change, I think you'd probably agree that most of them are here in our day too, and just as prominent as they ever were. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. If we were to just go across to Galatians chapter 5, you have a similar passage talking about how we live to satisfy the Lord and to live by the Spirit. And you listen to the list of acts of sin that he jots down there for us. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. You see, the list has got a bit longer. And it's not because the Galatians were worse than the Colossians. It's just that Paul is just simply saying, here are a few of the things that I can just mention off the top of my head. And we could add to that list all sorts of things that are not honouring to the Lord. And yet people are involved in, in all sorts of ways in our current society today. And he says, you've got to put those things behind you, put to death those things. Literally kill them off. And that's about having head in the clouds. That's about keeping our hearts and our minds set on things above. And so in practical terms, we have to examine ourselves as Christians and say, is there anything in me that just imagine for a moment that Jesus was to stand suddenly in front of me? Would I be ashamed to be caught in the act? If he was to challenge me there and then say, what are you doing? And the truth is that probably all of us at some point have found ourselves caught out like that. I think in principle that John Wesley was right when he said something along the lines of that it is possible for a human being to live a completely sinless life. I think in practice it's impossible. I think the, the principle of what he's saying is right. That you can live a life without sin, so why can't you perpetuate that? And to go on, we have the power of God at work in us that allows us to live for his glory and not for our own gratification. But in practice, I think Wesley was, was wrong. I think his, 
head was so much in the clouds perhaps that he hadn't got his feet back on the ground because is there anybody who's ever lived the sinless life no not at all but we need to be aiming for that we need to be aiming with goals that are way way above what we ourselves command i said to you last week that there is nothing that you can do to live the godly life on your own and by your own character and efforts it has to be what christ does in you it has to be the enabling by the spirit and he does that by changing us from deep within us i love romans 12 and you know I often have to remind myself of those words in verse 2 Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. We are transformed in our minds. That's why it's important that we have Christ in us, Christ in you, that his thoughts become our thoughts his ways become our ways and that we have to stand and reject those pressures upon us to conform to the pattern of this world we're no longer citizens of earth but citizens of heaven need i remind you but secondly i want to look at feet on the ground you see it's all very well isn't it to be head in the clouds i remember one pastor's wife saying one day um, i'm not going to mention names just in case anybody knows who i'm talking about but i remember her saying one day she was a little bit upset with her husband pastor's wives do get upset with their husbands on time it's not very often of course but it does occasionally happen and i remember this particular pastor's wife um, she was upset her husband had he hadn't missed a significant occasion but um, he had played it down shall we say he had played it down and very spiritually for their wedding anniversary rather than buying her a lovely bunch of flowers or taking her out to dinner um, he prayed over her now it's nice it's great that he prayed over her but it would have been nice if he brought the flowers too perhaps and i remember her saying he's too heavenly minded to be of any earthly use she used that well coined phrase he's too heavenly minded to be of any earthly use she said when we have our head in the clouds we mustn't get to that stage of being too heavenly minded to be of no earthly use we also have to have our feet on the ground in other words we are still living here on this earth we still have to walk with everybody else. We're still living here. We might be citizens of heaven, but we're posted and seconded to earth. We're here for a reason, because we are supposed to bring about through our lives and through the things that we say and do and the people that we are, we bring the life of Christ through us to the world around us. We become channels of God's love peace and joy so feet on the ground is an absolute must and if we're going to look at feet on the ground i want to take the second part of our passage this morning verses 12 to 17 and just bring out one or two thoughts for you uh, from there on having feet on the ground keep your head in the clouds always keep your feet on the ground therefore as god's chosen people holy and dearly loved clothe yourselves with and then he lists all the things that should be the attributes of God's people in verse 12. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. In other words, we are to see the very attributes of Christ alive in us if you're to put to death the old 
way of life, the old attributes of our earthly humanity and all the faults that are there, then we are to bring to life the wonderful, gracious attributes that are found in Christ. That we are to live just like him. That we are to have the same compassion that he had, the same kindness that he had, the same humility and gentleness and patience. Again, paralleled in Galatians chapter 5 that we turned to earlier and often referred to as the fruit of the Spirit. When the Spirit of Christ lives in you, this is the fruit that is produced. And it's not an optional extra. It's not like going into the, uh, the supermarket and saying, I have bananas, but I don't want apples. You don't get the choice. Somebody's pointed out it's fruit of the Spirit rather than fruits. It's not plural, it's one. And so when you buy a single fruit, it has all the goodness in it. It's made up of many different parts. And when you start to genetically modify your Christian faith to take out the bits that you don't want, and to add in the bits that you do, you're no longer the natural child of Christ, of God. So we have him and everything about him. And he becomes the life in us. See, the Bible says that I have been crucified and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. My old way of life has gone. All of those, those bits are dead. They've been put to death. And now it is the life of Christ. That's feet on the ground. How do I live in this society? I have to show all of these attributes of Christ and more. Again, just as the other list wasn't uh, exclusive or, or um, uh, so extensive as well. The same is true of this one. There is much more that you could find. Many other attributes of Christ, his character, his thoughts that you need to see in your life. It goes on in verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace and be thankful. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as you teach and admonish one another. Let me just stop there for a minute. So we have this hearts and minds thing again that comes here, just as we had it with the head in the clouds, we have it with feet on the ground too. It's all about having our hearts and minds in tune with the Lord himself. And so he says, just as you have your heart set on Christ, you let his word well, in you, and the word you is plural, so he's not talking about an individual. He's talking about you as the whole church together. Let the word of Christ be rich in you. That's why it's important to teach the word of God. That's why it's important. And we put an emphasis on understanding what the scriptures say. Because that is the word of God to us made clear through his Holy Spirit. And it's important that for each of us that we study that individually. It's important that we can ask questions. It's important that when there's something we don't understand that we try to dig and delve a little further, that we might know for ourselves exactly what it's saying. But it's also important that we look out for each other Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1 says, carry each other's burdens. Carry each other's burdens. In this way you fulfill the law of Christ. The burdens are not just the heavy loads that perhaps we sometimes think of as burdens, you know. Oh, I've got a lot of work on at the moment. And you say, oh, how can I help you? That's nice if you're able to, of course. But the burdens here are just talking about, again, it's all about the old way of life that's weighing heavily upon us, saying you can't cope with that on your own, that we help one another through this and to bring about the new life of Christ that needs to be in us. 
And as we do that, and as we look out for each other, we're told to help each other. It tells us to use simple ways of constantly reminding. And I love this, actually. Here where it tells us to use songs, uh, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, with gratitude in your hearts to God. It's always been a traditional way of making the word of God known and rich among his people is to make sure that everybody hears it. Now, there was a time when people couldn't read for themselves. It's very difficult. So they used to make songs up that brought about the truths of Scripture, and people would be able to sing them and memorize them in that way. It's still a good way to do it. I wonder how many of us from time to time get up on a Monday morning And you know, that particular song that we sung in church the day before is just rattling around in your head. I know it happens to some of you. And some of you, um, you know, just can't get rid of it. And people have said to me, you know, I've had that song going around in my head all week long. And it won't go away. Well, that's a good thing, actually. That's something that's really positive. As long as, of course, the song is accurate. And that's why it's important to have um, good theology as we write our songs as well. It's good to know about our psalms too. And again, they used to sing a lot of psalms. The psalms was the hymn book of the Bible. We don't sing psalms in our particular tradition of church, or not directly, but actually a lot of the psalms have been put to music and we sing them in some of the songs that we sing anyway good to have those little reminders it's good to encourage one another to correct each other not in a judgmental sense but it uses that word admonish now again I think it's worth just pausing here to say that the word admonish can sound a little bit harsh it's not meant to sound that it's meant to show that that actually the correction that we give to each other is not sort of a stern kind of correction but it's kind of a helping of each other. When we see somebody starting to go off the rails, to come alongside them, to gently encourage them back to where they need to be. That is what life in Christ is all about. That's what the church is meant to be all about. And in that way, the life of Christ grows within us and something absolutely wonderful begins to happen. Because you see, When Christ is in you, and when you are growing in maturity in Christ, and developing his attributes in your life, that you become attractive. Attractive to other people who say, I want what you have. It gives you the opportunity to be able to explain why you think differently why you act differently, why there may be some things that you're able to laugh at and other things you say, look, you know, I really don't find that funny. Why you're able to stand up in some circumstances and say, you know, there's an issue here that we need to stand up for these people and their situation, their circumstances, while others may be wanting to just hide and bury their heads in the sand. There's a strength of character that says that no matter what we go through, that we go through it with the Lord. Therefore, we fear nothing. Well, at least that's the theory. And as we do that, we become attractive in itself. And guess what happens? The church begins to grow. Without pushing a lot of money into it, although money helps without appointing lots of extra leaders to try and jolly people up, it becomes organic growth. And what's more, it's not just a superficial growth that is numerical, but it's a growth that starts deep in the heart. And if it starts deep in the heart, then it will be long-lasting. The problem with if you have superficial numerical growth 
is that as soon as whatever attracted the numbers to come disappears, they disappear too. If it's really rooted deep down the seed of Christ in somebody's heart, there is absolutely nothing that will separate them from the love of Christ. Nothing at all. And so that must be our aim as individuals and as a church, that we want to see Christ in us growing, developing, that we are able to live in this world with our feet on the ground whilst keeping our heads looking to Christ, heads in the clouds. I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you say, is my head really in the clouds? And are my feet firmly on the ground in Christ? Is he in you? Is he growing in you? Is he making a difference in you? Are you seeing the old way of life put to death and the new way of life in the spirit coming to life? And do you want to see more of that? Because I encourage you not to just ignore this, not to just walk away from it, but say, what am I going to do? I'm here to help where I can. There are other people who might be able to help you that you know well. I encourage you to speak to people. Don't stand alone in these things. And don't allow yourselves to be fooled by that old um, deception that if I just ignore it, it will go away. It won't. Do something about it today. Let's pray.